the union once, and uh, proudly so, and I, I understand what an important role the unions play in the state, both politically and economically, so I'm happy to start the dialogue with uh, the AFL-CIO members. Realistically, do you think you have any chance of getting an endorsement from this group? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess if people would say, well, why did you come here? Well, listen, I, I'm a consensus builder. As I said, uh, unions are going to be an important part of solving the state's problems, uh, getting us headed back in, in, in the right direction. And uh, so I need to communicate with, with the unions and, and the, the uh, you know, as, as representatives of so many people who are out of work, so many people who uh, are involved in, in state government. Uh, this is a, it's an important dialogue. You know, I actually can't remember which union it was, but it was uh, when I was working at a can plant in, in uh, Denver, Colorado, back in the 60s. You were making cans? Uh, it was a plant that made cans. I was working on an assembly line. You described that to me as less than a, a happy experience. That you didn't feel that you got much for your union representative when we took the representation when we talked a long time ago about that. I don't think I said that. Oh, all right, I'll go, I'll go check my notes. <laughs> they have a big no, that was actually a pretty good job. It was, it was a good paying job in the state. I was quite young. I think I was 18 years old. They referenced the banner that they have on the wall here from A. Philip Randolph that basically says, as a union, you fight for benefits and you hold on to those benefits. This is a day and age when people are saying, because of the state budget's problems, etc., that maybe some of those benefits uh, need to be negotiated or given up. Um, do you agree with that? And, and how does that, what, what do you think that would do for you with, with union people or labor people in general? Well, there's a only a certain amount of money that the government has to spend, and it can it can choose to spend it on benefits or payroll. So if uh, if the choice is benefits, then there are going to be fewer state workers. If the if the load of, of, of the cost of the benefits is is lower, then uh, the state can afford to employ more people. So that really will be up to the there are representatives to negotiate and make that choice. We have about uh, a 60% payroll load for state workers in terms of what the benefits cost versus the payroll. In the private sector, it's more typically in the high 20s or 30%, so we just can't sustain the, that cost level. But the, ultimately, the choice on whether we, uh, how many people we can employ versus the cost of the benefits will be made made by the union reps. One of the things that Dan Roy stressed earlier when he got here was that the unions have not really been used or invited by the administration to participate. They're, they've come up with ideas on uh, cross-cutting and really they haven't been utilized. Would you um, try to change that? Would you reach out to them? Because the past Republican governors really haven't. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether or not that what he's saying is true, but certainly uh, I think if you're a leader of a large organizations such as the state government, you need to listen to the input of people at all levels of the organization. So a good governor and a good leader, I think, um, will have an ear open to, to comments and input from the union representatives and the employees themselves all up and down the organization. How would you approach that differently, I guess, than Governor Will or Governor Boland? Because it doesn't seem to have been that kind of communication back and forth, yeah. the trust. Well, of course, that uh, communication isn't all done directly with the governor. But I think you do it by appointing, first of all, commissioners who, who listen and who are leaders and, and uh, believe that, that getting the input uh, all up and down the organization is important and take the time to do it. Rightly or wrongly, during the primary campaign, you were portrayed sort of as the corporate bad guy. And now those, those ads are watched not just by Republicans, but everybody. Um, how do you get through to a, a blue-collar worker who may feel that that's the impression of who you are and that's not who they want for government? Well, first of all, those ads were false, and we tried to make that clear. Um, uh, what they were saying about the, the BIP company I think you're referring to, I had nothing to do with that company at the time that that plant was closed. I frankly saved that company, and I think uh, if you talk to uh, many of the employees who were there when I was there and know, know what was going on, um, Several of the people featured there weren't actually weren't employees of the company. I don't think any of the people who were interviewed there actually knew who I was uh, until they were prompted by the, uh, the people who were producing the ad. So I think if you talk to people you get a, who are actually involved at Bib, you get a very different story. But how do you get that message across to the average person who may see the stereotype? Uh, 
Well, the message you get across primarily to, to people who aren't directly involved in the process is either through the media, such as yourselves, uh, or through advertising. Uh, so I think that, I, I don't know that we're going to specifically address uh, that issue in, in advertising, but I think that uh, as people get to know me better and uh, know uh, about my record, the, uh, my real record, I think they'll, I don't think they'll think I was a corporate bad guy. Dan Malloy is going to have six million dollars in public financing uh, very shortly. Um, do you uh, are you confident that you will you will personally guarantee an equal amount if you can't raise it? I haven't said that. Did no, I'm asking you. I'm, I'm asking. You. That's a question. Yeah. I'm asking. <laughs> I know you haven't said it. That's why I'm asking. Well, uh, it, it, this is going to be a, an expensive race, and we will raise, and I will uh, put in with amount of money that's necessary to, to uh, you know, have a, have a strong viable campaign. I've said that from the beginning. Have you said how much you'd be willing to contribute personally? No. Would you match Linda McMahon at 50 million? Uh, probably not. <laughs> You're trying to raise money, though. Do you, seriously, do you think it discourages contributions, the perception that you can put in millions? You did loan your primary campaign for $3 million at least. So does that hurt your fundraising efforts among Republicans to uh, get other dollars? I don't actually know the answer to that question, but uh, I did raise a million, uh, $1.8 million between the Senate and the uh, governor's race. It's pretty good. Uh, I think uh, in, if you compare that to what people have done in the past, certainly for a primary, that's quite a lot of money to have raised. So I'm, ex I'm expecting now that I'm the nominee. It'll be even easier to raise money, and we'll, be, we'll do quite well. Can I ask about the fact that you loaned money to your own campaign, which means, of course, that you'll have the ability later on to repay yourself for, for that loan, uh, potentially from people, uh, you know, when there's, there's not as much attention on, on who is who's supporting your campaign. Um, and, and I've just heard some concern that, that maybe it's, it's not as open and clear uh, who is, in fact, supporting your campaign if, if you're, you're doing this sort of fact the fact that you're well, that's not why you loan money to a campaign. You loan money to a campaign so that when the campaign's over, if there's anything left, you can actually get it back. Because if you if you give it to the campaign, you can't recover. Um, so you won't be raising funds also, after the fact. That also, we, we we still hope to raise money to help pay for our expenses during the primary. And if you don't have loans, you can't do that. So there there there's no lack of transparency. That's not true. It's always known who's contributed to the campaigns. You, you're required to report it in, in a timely fashion. So can you raise money after the fact to pay yourself back for your personal loans? Yeah, but it still has to be reported. You said that you're willing to talk to Dan about going um, by not having any negative ads. Uh, Dan said you haven't spoken to each other. Is there going to be some kind of a meeting, a phone call, or something about that? Uh, I, I suspect there will be. Um, uh, and, uh, I do want to talk to him about no negative ads. He's actually talked, I guess, through Nancy Linares, but limiting spending to $3 million. I'd be happy to talk to him about that, as long as we can agree that their special interests aren't, can't spend money independently. Uh, so I'd like to sit down with him and, and set some ground rules, uh, because uh, I think what we saw in the primary campaign is hopefully something that will be repeated in the general. Happen this week? I hope so. Yeah. So you're working on that. 